When I was 26 years old, I was assigned a magazine story about a mafia murder case. I called a former detective to interview him. He didn't know anything about the case, but he wanted to know about my last name. He asked if I was related to the famous Konigsberg. I thought he meant Woody Allen, whose real name is Allen Konigsberg, and he's no relation to me. He said, no, 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 I'm talking about Harold Konigsberg, the famous mafia hitman. I thought this was pretty far out. So I called my father. He said, have you ever heard of this guy, Harold Konigsberg, the famous mafia hitman? He said, yes, that's my Uncle Heshi. <laughs> he said he was Grandpa Leo's younger brother. I don't know that much about him. Please tell me you told this person you're not related to him. He said, why would you want your name, our family name, attached to someone like that? He said to drop the assignment and to never write about the mafia. So I dropped the assignment. I was always very close to my parents, and at that point I had no problem heeding their guidance and direction. It had served me well. Still, I was pretty surprised by my father's reaction. My family is as generic as Midwestern Jews come. I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska. My father is a surgeon. It was the only time I'd heard my father use an important sounding expression like our family name. <laughs> but I was pretty curious, so I went to the library. I found out that Harold Konigsberg was indeed a legendary mafia hitman. His nickname was K.O., K.O. Konigsberg, is in K period, O period for knockout. He had been an amateur boxer, and, and when that didn't go so well, he traded up to a life of organized crime. <laughs> he worked for four of the five uh, mafia families in New York, plus the one in New Jersey. He was, he was kind of a, a freelance independent contractor. He sometimes worked for more than one family at the same time if he felt like it. He was known also as the king of all loan sharks. He, conducting business out of a half dozen offices in New York and New Jersey, he claimed to have a million dollars on the street at any given time. I came across a, a story in Life magazine from 1968. It said, it said, uh, quoted a federal, federal official saying, uh, the mafia considered the hulking K.O. an animal on the leash for them. All they had to do was unsnap the leash and he'd kill for the fun of it. He was also very smart, apparently. He had taught himself the law uh, and represented himself in two major trials. Then he wrote his own appeals in prison and got a murder conviction against himself overturned. So one night... In 1997, I got a voicemail. It went something like this. Well, I'm not going to give you a message. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Tomorrow's another day. If you're home between 8 and 8.30, I'll call you. We'll talk. We'll have a nice conversation. And I'm telling you, it's a very, very interesting conversation, Mr. Konigsberg. That's your name, ain't it? Eric Konigsberg? All right, kid. Take care and God bless. So I played the message for my father. <laughs> he said, yeah, that's Uncle Heshi. <laughs> he said, don't tell your grandmother about this. So the next time I saw my grandmother, I asked her about Uncle Heshi. I told her he'd called. What had happened is I had mentioned who my great uncle was to an editor at The New Yorker who'd given me an assignment to write about him. And my father had somehow come around to this. It wasn't that he, he believed in, uh, that there was any value to what I was doing, but it was a pretty big break, and I needed the work. <laughs> my grandmother and the aunts, uh, we were all together, my aunts, my great aunts, Harold's, Harold's other sisters, at, um, at my grandmother's 80th birthday party in Las Vegas. My grandmother, she loves the slots. And, and when I mentioned Harold's name, everybody groaned. 
One of my aunts said, you won't learn anything about us from him. What does he have to do with us? And my grandmother sort of uh, played him off as a, as a braggart and a blowhard. She claimed not to know that he was in prison for murder. <laughs> she described him as a ganif, a crook. Uh, and she said, don't go. Don't go to see him. He will never leave you alone. What good could possibly come of it? My grandmother explained that when she and my grandfather were starting out, they had a business. He was a butter and egg man in Bayonne, New Jersey. Um, and, and living there and having a business there in the same town where Harold was so well known was a great burden to be under. She said they spent 30, 40 years ignoring his existence, not taking his phone calls. Uh, my entire generation, my brother and me, our cousins, none of us had even known about him. They had tried to erase him. She said, now, after all this, this is what you want us to be known for? She said, why don't you write a nice story about my 80th birthday party? <laughs> she, said, she said, please, don't go up there. So in the summer of 1998, I went to Auburn Correctional Facility <laughs> to visit my great uncle Harold. Uh, Auburn is in upstate New York. He's serving a life sentence uh, for the murder of a Teamsters boss. Um, and he had seen my byline in a magazine and figured out uh, that I'm his great nephew, which is why he had called for me. Uh, and um, um, what was I going to say? <laughs> and so up I went. I went to Auburn. I had this assignment. Uh, and it was and it was a great assignment. It was a big career break. So I went there and I waited in the visitors' room, and in walked my great uncle. Uh, he was big and fat, uh, with beautiful long white hair like my grandfather's. He, he reminded me a lot of my of my gentle giant uh, of a grandfather, the butter and egg man, who was who was just you know, who was obsessed with his reputation as a, as a decent and honest person, and and a very kind. Uh, sweet man. He had blue eyes like my grandfather, um, and I extended my hand to shake hands, and he said, what the fuck kind of way is that to greet family? And instead, he planted a kiss on my mouth. <laughs> then he asked after all our living relatives by name, people he'd never met. He was showing off. Harold was a paradoxical figure, just as I'd heard him described by others. He was, he was at once very seductive, very appealing when he wanted to be, very charming, and also very frightening. He knew how to play for my sympathies. Uh, he told me how his sisters and my grandfather and grandmother had sat shiva for him at one point when he went away to prison, how they never took his calls, and they hadn't in decades he said that um, he asked me to bring in a picture once of the family, and I brought a photograph of, of me and my cousins and the aunts, my grandmother from her 80th birthday party, and he looked at it, and I saw a tear roll down his cheek, and he said, now that's a complete family. He once was asking about the cousins. Uh, we figured out that of the six cousins in my, uh, my grandmother's grandchildren, was the only one who wasn't in graduate school at the time. We had three in law school, my brother was in med school, and I had a, a cousin at Wharton. And he asked why I didn't want to go to grad school. I said, well, you know, I, I guess I kind of like to do my own thing. And he said, sounds to me you're a lot like your Uncle Harold. <laughs> and I admit that from this somehow I took some measure of satisfaction. <laughs> at the same time, he could be very frightening. When I had first gotten up there, I asked why he, why he had summoned me, and he said, I'm thinking about taking the story of my life and fictionalizing it some. He said, then we sell it to those Weinstein brothers at Miramar Pictures. <laughs> Thought we could make some money. I, was very, I made it very clear that I had this assignment from the New Yorker. I, I had to write a true story about him. He was ambivalent about that. Sometimes he talked, sometimes... He talked some more. Uh, I always went up there thinking he wasn't going to see me, kind of hoping he wasn't, and he would. Sometimes he threw out Don Vito-like threats. 
he would tell me a story. He would brag about murders he committed without ever completely incriminating himself. Uh, or he would talk about the fights he got in in prison. Uh, and and he would sometimes he would he would tell a story and say, "But you're not going to write that." I'd say, "Of course I am." He'd say, "Well, I don't think you would do that." Or he'd say, "If you wrote that, then I don't know you." It was pretty unsettling. <laughs> and after a while, I decided to stop visiting him. I, I saw him 10 times over the first year, year plus, uh, and I realized I could learn a lot more about him pursuing, pursuing other avenues. Um, I interviewed dozens and dozens of people prosecutors, his lawyers, detectives, FBI agents, other gangsters, uh, family members of his victims. It turned out there were a lot of victims. Although he was only convicted of one murder, uh, I found through obtaining some sealed uh, FBI files that he had confessed to as many as 20 murders uh, under some kind of very flimsy immunity agreement, and none of those others had been prosecuted. So I was in no hurry to get back up there and see him again. <laughs> I turned in a story, and my editor said, it's fine. It's just one thing. You need to go back up there one more time. He said, you need to give him the chance to answer to what you found out about him. And he said, uh, uh, it would be great if your great uncle would cooperate with the magazine's fact-checking department. <laughs> <laughs> I had gotten a couple of letters from Harold right after I stopped visiting, wondering where the hell I was, and then he had, those had stopped, and I, and I, you know, I was really nervous going back up. I flew upstate one last time, um, and, uh, and I waited in the visitor's room, and, and I had a feeling this was coming, that, that I knew I was going to have to see him one more time. I'd been rehearsing this for a little while. He sat, sat down with me in the visitor's room, and I, I said I had a lot of impatient editors on my hands, and the magazine was going to press the following week with my story on him. And Harold took this in very calmly. He nodded, absorbing my words. He said, the day an article comes out that has your name on it and my name in it, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> yeah, you laugh. You laugh. I didn't know what to say to this. He said, the kind of person that would shame his family like this, you forfeit your blood connection. And to think you're a Kohen, he said. <laughs> <laughs> he said it would give him great pleasure. Uh, I invoked my, my matriarch of a grandmother's name. I said how my grandmother and the great aunts had all talked to me about him. He said it would great, give me great pleasure for your grandmother to come visit you at your grave. He said, I can't believe you're killing me after 38 years I've been in here and you're killing me like this. You wouldn't last 38 minutes in this place. He's been in prison continuously since 1961. Um, and I mustered, I was really proud of this. I said, but Harold, because I couldn't call him Uncle Heshi, and I, I couldn't even call him Heshi after a while. It was just felt too familiar. I said, but Harold, I'm not the one killing you. You're the one who did these things you've done. He said, that kind of double double talk that's worthy of torture. <laughs> he said, I'm going to chop you up a hundred different ways, and you can put that in your fucking magazine. And then he asked me to get him an orange soda. <laughs> so he drank the soda, and he held the bottle, the empty bottle in the air. He said, you see this? I said, yeah, I see that. He said, I'm going to shove this up your ass and light a firecracker in it. <laughs> then he went back to listing all the ways he was going to kill me. He, he made a claw. He saw me look toward the guards, which were right there. He made a claw with his thumb and forefingers. He said, I only need this to kill you. I could go right through your eye and rip your fucking brain out of your head before the guards get here. He said something, um, something about strangling me with the boot lace. 
and maybe some other things that I'm not remembering. So finally I realized, I, I don't have to take this any longer. So I stood up and I walked to the edge of the room and then I realized I can't just leave like this. So I turned around and I said, you know I mean you no harm. And then in a voice that was so menacing, in a voice that, that really made me feel that everything I'd read and learned about him over the past couple of years was, was very true and very believable. He said, I mean you harm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, laugh all you want. But I was, I was terrified. I was really frightened. I flew back to New York and I didn't want to go home. So I checked into a hotel. My editor called from the New Yorker. I told him about it. He said, that's very powerful material. And then my father called. He knew that I was going up there, and he was very concerned. And I didn't want to tell him about it, but I told him about it. And he said, well, you're not going to pull the story. He said, I didn't raise my son to be a writer so he could let some, some villain tell him what to do. I thought this was a lovely sentiment. <laughs> but still, Harold was threatening to kill me. My father said he really didn't know what else he could do. He said, call your grandmother. Everyone listens to her. So I told a friend of mine, she said, oh, so, so Granny's going to call off the hit. <laughs> it, was, it was really humiliating. It was humiliating. I'd never seen my father frightened before, and I haven't since. My mother called me up. She said, she said your father is pacing around the house. I can't believe you're doing this to him. She said, when I say your father is white as a sheet, he's white as a sheet. I called my grandmother, and I got a round of I told you so's. She said, you said you wanted to write about him. She said, oh, Heshi's a lot of hot air. And she said, she said, well, I wish you hadn't done this, but nobody threatens my grandson. <laughs> so we devised a plan. We devised a plan. She would get Harold's adult daughter on the phone. Part of Harold's ambivalence to my writing about him had to do with uh, embarrassing his daughters. Part of it had to do with he, he thought I was hurting his chances of parole. Uh, and so, and so uh, she said she would get his daughter on the phone. When she got his daughter on the phone, she said, how do I know that, that you'll be able to calm him down? The adult daughter said, well, my sister and I are all he has right now. He does whatever we tell him. So I wish I could tell you that this episode uh, brought about a new era of openness for my family. But it didn't. In fact, uh, not that long ago, my grandmother came uh, to visit my family. Uh, it was a few months ago. My book came out in October. It was during the summer. She said, so what are you working on? I said, well, you know, I have this book coming out. Oh, really? Oh, that? I said, yeah, it's about Harold. She said, oh, that poor schmuck? I said, the poor schmuck, he threatened to kill me. He said, well, he doesn't like you. He said, why would you write a story about someone and only mention the bad things? And my father, I was very touched by this. He spoke up. He said, he said, mother, didn't you read what Eric wrote? He killed 20 people. He's a murderer. And my grandmother said, really? How can they say he killed someone if they never found the body? That's it. Thanks. <laughs>